I've been doing comedy six years now, I think. Six, five or six years. All right. I've been in Montreal for eight, so yeah, that sounds about right. Right? Yeah. Yeah, okay. Oh, that, that makes about so we've been you've been ahead of me in the game here for three years. You had a bit of a head start in the English scene, but you've been doing the French scene for a while. Yeah, I've been uh, I moved to Montreal basically for the French scene, and knowing that there was an English scene, I, I, I what I enjoyed is that I really had two options, two kind of platforms to like take off from, and uh, I do a lot of French, but I feel like the English market for me and we were talking about that the other day. Uh, the English market really, the ceiling is way higher because we, you can do English all over the world. Yeah. So, and I, I really love traveling and I, I love the aspect of doing comedy while you're traveling because you're learning a lot about these cultures as you're traveling and you get to share and and intake their culture as you're doing shows for them. You learn about a new culture before you make fun of it. I think you make fun of yourself within it. There we go. <laughs> how you're dealing with the new uh, with environment. The, with the new environment. Yeah, I feel that. I, I'd rather take it, see it like that than making fun of things. I, I, I feel like I, I like to make fun of how I react to these different things that I could make fun of. How so? Like, where, where have you been recently that's different from the Montreal scene that you've had a weird interaction with? It could be the same language, but just a different setting. Um, I was I was in uh, Nicaragua and Costa Rica last year, mm. and that was very different. And I, I guess I I wanted to do more material about the place, but I you didn't know I enough. Really, I really stuck to my material that I already had. Is it because you didn't know enough about Nicaragua? Because I've been in situations like where I'm in a town where I want to comment on it, mm. but I'm fifty feeling like is this just something I believe, but it's not really true. Like, this is a weird stereotype I just made up that I sh it won't be funny because I don't know it well enough, you know? I, I, I did a festival in France, and we did, I did two shows in the festival. And the first one, I did my material, and then I had, like, a week in between both and just talking to the people, really hanging out, drinking with them, staying up late. I learned a so much. I learned, like, just these expressions. And then I, I did my material, but I opened with, like... A, 45 segment of things inside jokes with them about about them and I really got them in my, the palm of my hands like that so I feel like when you go to places and you're traveling or you're you're there to work part of the work is connecting with the people you're with you the people you're in in whom you're in their environment what about say this scene here right this scene has uh, there's there's two scenes in one city yeah. So it's the French and the English. Yeah. What are the big differences that you see between the two scenes that are shared within one city? Um, well, the, I think the reason French comedy is so popular is that there's a star system in Quebec. Um, not that the, all the comedians are in the star system, but some of the top comedians are in it. So this makes the scene so much... Uh, that it, gives, it gives it a certain allure that there's stars in the quotation so marks. So people want to go out like, I, I know this guy. This guy's a star. He's a celebrity. I want to yeah. watch him. Whereas on the English scene, you feel like it's more of grinders. It's like, oh, there's a bunch of comics. Let me go see what they're thinking about. Well, They're not household names in the city. Exactly. Except yeah. for a few uh, a few comics. But I, I feel like there's the uh, comedy club culture in English. I feel like, like I said, the ceiling is higher, but this... This lower ceiling in Quebec makes it like a tighter, t tight knit environment. I actually see what you're saying. I get, I get where you're coming from. There is a bit of a yeah. There, there is that star system actually in the Quebec scene. We, we have it. See on the English scene with certain guys. Like if you hear, a, you know, David Pride is coming or uh, Joey Elias, uh, Sugar Sammy, that kind of stuff. Yeah. To us, that's part of that system. Like, oh, it's them. Let me go yeah. see what they're up to. But for the most part, it's not like the French scene where you could go to a club and it's just the opener, the middler, it's all going to be guys that they see on TV, yeah. uh, you know, on TVR or whatever. I don't know what the French channels are here. I don't watch them. But <laughs> you know what I'm talking about. Yeah, I do. Yeah, no, it is interesting. But also, that, like the English market, like people in Montreal, they know a whole lot of other comedians. So the local comedians are swimming in an ocean. Whereas in Quebec, they're, they're swimming in a, in a river or something. Yeah. 
And it, it, like, it, there's a very good scene. I'm not. There's a very good scene in both. It's just different in that way. Like, I'm gonna can, come. I'm gonna come hang on the the French scene a bit. Yeah, you're, you're gonna bring me around. I'm gonna yeah, try to sure. translate my shit into French. Yeah, see how that goes on stage. Yeah, that'd be. Awesome. Uh, I'm very curious because I hear the best things about that club. The shirt that you're wearing, yeah. the bordel. I only hear. I've never heard anybody say anything it's negative about it. Sold out two months in advance. Yeah, that's another thing I heard. It's crazy. I'm Mike Patterson was telling me backstage at the Nest because he started doing the French scene a little while ago. Yeah, and he was saying how great it all was. And they're there. They're loud. Uh, they're roaring yeah. to go. You don't need to prep them. Like, they know what they're there for. They go on a mission. Yeah. They got their tickets in advance. They're there to laugh, not to fuck around. It's, uh, you, you don't get that walk-in uh, ambiance that we'll get at the English clubs. There's a lot of people that just walk in, don't know what they're in for. They might not be having funny. They, they might not be having fun. They might sit there with their arms crossed. Yeah. So they'll get mad. But that's the best club. Like, there's some clubs in, in French that are like that, too. That are just shit clubs? Well... Not that they're shit, but like people aren't trained to watch a comedy show. Uh, the conditions aren't necessarily perfect. This is like the the top notch. This it's it's a comedian comedian's dream. It's a comedy club built by comedians. It's owned by five comedians, and um, everything's perfect. It's modeled on uh, like New York style comedy clubs, and everything would everything is just amazing there. I like what I'm here. What about because you, before you came in here, you were talking about Russia. Yeah. Would you perform comedy in Russia, or now that uh, what did they get? They got banned from the Olympics. Yeah, they got banned. F- I think it's from all the drug, uh, the, the positive drug testings. So now, so what the happened? The whole country. So now, what what they're saying? I just read a quick article just before coming. They're saying that Russia's out of the Olympics, but the Russian athletes can compete. How does that make any but sense? They they compete under like the. They're like just Olympians. Okay, so if they I win a medal, if I win a medal and I'm Russian right now, yeah, the medal it is represented. Count for your country, but it counts you, for me though. Yeah. So the Republic of Pantelis, yeah, has a medal. Yeah. So every Russian is now a republic. That is kind of so. Oh, okay, so th- let's say here's another question. I don't know if you know the answer, but I just thought of something. Four Russians, yeah. win medals. Is it four Russian medals for the new Russian Republic of uh, Russian Olympians, or is it four individual? statistical like pieces that get I the medal. Do you see what I'm saying? Like, do they yeah. group them together? No, no, they group them all together. Okay. So if, if there's, like, an athlete from a country that isn't represented and he's the only one, they're going to go... It's all going to go in under that column. The other column. Yeah. This is interesting, but I have been thinking... I thought about this actually a couple of weeks ago. I didn't think about it for a while, though, that the way the Olympics are, it used to be, let's see which country can develop the best athlete. Yeah. Right with their programs, like I know for Winter Olympics in Canada, we kill it. Right, we have good hockey programs. So let's see what country can develop the best racer, the best this, the best that. But I think in the last couple of years is who has the best scientists, yeah, and can hide the drugs better. Yeah, that's what it's been. I I think they should have a another Olympic, another another Olympics. It would be everything's allowed. I'd love to see that. So shit. then it would just be science. But then how would the boxing, the fighting work? You'd see people's heads explode. Yeah. But they got into it. <laughs> yeah, they knew what they signed up for. <laughs> yeah. But actually, you know what's funny is you're saying it kind of jokingly, but I think that would sell oh. tickets. I'd love to see even um, sports. Like, if you could give me a sport where I know that they're on steroids and they're all just Everyone fucking crazy, steroids. I'd love to watch that. Like 80s wrestling. Yeah, like it's just over the top. Yeah. You, you don't know what's going to happen. veins on the veins. His muscles have muscles. Yeah. That's how they used to be. Same thing with wrestling. Like, I don't know why they hide it. It's either you're going to make a conscious effort to not do steroids. You're like, this is completely banned if we think about it. If we even think you're on something, you're out. Or, you know, or you just do it. You embrace it. This whole facade of we're against steroids. And then you have, like in the WWE, right? We're against, and then every picture you see of these fucking guys, like, really? That guy's not on fucking steroids? Are you kidding me? His biceps <laughs> have triceps and there's no fucking problems with this? Yeah. It's... I don't well, know. I, I like that they're making an effort. I mean, are they really though, or is it a facade? That's what I'm saying. I don't think th- they're well, making an effort. That's why. That's what. That's the whole uh, saga with the GSP. Hmm. He was saying He's healthy. exactly that. He was saying like how people are hiding it and how it's corrupt, and he wasn't doing it. And then he was. It was. It was just absurd because he was fighting against guys who were doing it and hiding it, and then he had to compete against these like monsters. That's dangerous, though. That's the other thing is yeah. people don't don't talk about. We like to joke about what if everybody was on steroids and they were fighting each other. That would look cool. It would look like a monster movie. 
But how about the person who's not on steroids? Yeah. He's fighting on a regular person's maximum capacity. Yeah. And then he gets his head busted open by a fucking mutant. Exactly. Shouldn't that be illegal? Shouldn't the person doing that, or the scientist that helped the guy hide the fucking steroids, shouldn't somebody be liable for killing someone in the ring if it happens? Or in another sport? Who knows, right? There's. Yeah. No, it's. And it's good that they're making an effort to like, clean it up because now athletes can train and not have to think about they have to do it. Like the Tour de France is the same. They're all on drugs and trying to hide it. Yeah. All on it. And even when Lance got caught, he was saying, well, everybody is. So who do you give that medal to that I lost? Like the if Second place was also on the roids. The last place, the guy who didn't. He said, if you don't do drugs, you could not finish the Tour de France. But that's an interesting thing. Like, are we pushing them too hard? Of course. <laughs> so, like, I don't know. Is it We're pushing them too hard in the sense that they had to resort to this to, in order to stay competitive. So it's too late. Like, uh. I'm just, I'm, I wonder where we draw the line. Because for athletes, I guess in terms of, we draw the line because in terms of fairness, we all think of it like, oh, you're cheating. Right. But if you have a job, you're a teacher like that teacher that got caught now. I don't know if you saw the students videotaped him snorting lines of coke between oh, classes. I saw that quickly. Yeah. yeah. So he's just enhancing his performance as a teacher. All right. Yeah. He just wants to go on for a couple more hours. He's getting more lesson within the hour. That's all he's doing. He's like, man, I got another class. I got to be up for these kids. They're the future. Yeah. I'm willing to sacrifice my body yeah. for their education. Right. Yeah. But like, he's a villain. He's vilified. He didn't give them the drugs. No. He's taking all this risk on himself yeah. to help educate those kids. <laughs> I feel like we're seeing it the wrong way, yeah. right? He's, this guy's this guy's a fucking hero. Yeah. Shouldn't there be lines? He should be doing speed as well. He sh- this he guy to speed up the process. I mean, really? Slow kids just have to keep up. Uh, if he's teaching a kindergarten class and he wants them to be calm, he should be on heroin. He should just be mellow. He should just be down, calm with the kids. Doesn't matter what they do. He's never going to get upset. We can use drugs yeah. for certain jobs, is what I'm thinking. That's what I'm suggesting. To the public right now is there certain <laughs> drugs that certain professions need to Every use. Every drug. But yeah, I think maybe we do push certain people too too far. Like there's there's uh, even students I know in university. Um, some of my buddies uh, I, w- I would name drop, but I won't now because they come on my other shows a lot, so I don't want. But they had to take a lot of um, what was it? I don't know if it was Ritalin or Speed or whatever the fuck they were taking to help them through exams. They had a lot. They're like, oh, different class. I gotta get this done. I can't sleep. I gotta do this. I gotta do that. But why are we letting students get to that level where they're not really learning? Mm. You're asking him to just memorize crazy shit yeah. and, and, you know, fill out fucking forms really fast. I guess that's a skill in the long term to be able to memorize so much in a short amount of time. But you're right. It shouldn't be just that. It shouldn't well, be like just we're, that. We're building people to memorize a lot of stuff in a short amount of time. And we should be, it should be broader education. It should be, there should be more emphasis on philosophy, on analyze analyzing just general subjects just regu- regular yeah. uh, social situations yeah. where i see people discussion yeah discussions people Based that don't know discussion. how to have an argument right yeah i've noticed this a lot where um i don't know the, i guess the way i grew up the way i think it is i might have an idea but i know going in i might be wrong yeah. so my plan when i'm discussing with you is to see if i could take points away from you for you to change my mind yeah like okay let me just see where he's coming from because i might have this wrong yeah right rhetoric Whereas, now it's not like that though now it's very much whether you're arguing the color of the sky whatever it is it's it doesn't matter what you tell me I'm, that's why I like this whole flat earth thing it doesn't matter what you're telling me the earth is flat but well listen what the fuck they're telling you the earth yeah. is probably not fucking flat i don't know where you're coming up with this yeah they're like no 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 it's it's all a fucking conspiracy yeah this is right wingers it's conspiracy yeah it's that's fucking that's, crazy. that's not that's absurd proving that's anything. not proving anything yeah that, like, it happens to me on twitter a lot when i argue about the flat earth yeah people are like the earth is flat i was like i don't know about that and like, oh, you're just part of the propaganda machine. And even, even if, like, I'm, I'm not saying that it is, but even if it is, why would you spend your whole life trying to prove <laughs> that? Isn't there more is important it, like, things? I don't know, but it's not. It's not flat. Uh, it would be cool it's, if it was, but it's it, not flat. It's, it's not possible. It's not, but if it is, I don't give a shit. <laughs> <laughs> it, w- if it, it would be cool if it was, because that means that we have understood zero of anything, yeah. oh, gravity works, so there's something cool. But Galilei it's not. Galilei was just amazing at proving. Yeah, 
false things. But it's not. That's the yeah, thing. Is know. We know it's not. There's science back in the... But then people will still stand their fucking ground. They ref- that's what I'm saying is that people... We don't teach this stuff to kids. Just this critical thinking of, wait, wait, let me analyze what this guy's saying. Yeah. Like politicians. Politicians get to play us like a fiddle because people won't sit back. Wait, 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 let me hear what this guy's saying. They just go by party. Yeah. Hey, I'm part of this party. They go Whatever by the surface. fuck they say, I'm in. What are you, fucking crazy? Yeah. You should never go with this... I'm liberal, I'm conservative, I'm Republican. I'm th- yeah. You can't, you shouldn't do that. You should go with every person, what the fuck they're saying. Maybe one one year, some fucking uh, candidate from another party speaks closer to you. Yeah. Forget the label. Go with what's beneficial to you, with what's closer in line with your values. Because yeah. or else, you're kind of victim to them. What if they decide from one day to the next to flip-flop on something? You voted for X person, he's doing the opposite of what you believe. You're going to try to change your worldview? You're like, oh, you know what? No, I'm for this. I'm for the war in that country. Like, but you weren't yesterday. Just because he changed his mind, now you're on board? What do you believe? Yeah. Find what you believe first and try to find people that can align with that instead of fucking forcing yourself in, in that team mentality. If I'm yeah. part of this team, what do they say? We yeah. kill those people? Yeah, we kill those people. But people go on surface. That's why I'm embarrassed to say that I'm a huge football fan. I love the NFL. But Why I, are you I embarrassed? Got, Everybody loves football. No. I'm not a big football fan. I, I, I'm embarrassed because people who don't know football just know it by surface. So to them, if they don't know football, they think I just like big guys crashing into each other with like old men following them with chains and then other men (laughs) throwing flags. That's all it is to them. Like if people don't dig in, and I'm paranoid about that. Like I know it's their fault that they they don't know more about the subject. But to me, some people, if I would say that I like football, would think, oh, this guy's an idiot. He just likes big guys crashing into each other from one end to the other of the field. But you're right about that. Sports does have that misconception where a lot of people, oh, you're a jock, all yeah. this. Thing. You can't like the athleticism of it. You can't like the... I love sport. I love the competition of sports. Yeah. I love the intensity. I love the adrenaline. You know, I liked playing sports when I was younger. Still, you know, when we get to play, I'll play. But I, I still love watching certain sports. I love the excitement. You don't know what's going to happen. Mm. I love that, the whole rivalry uh, I'm in. I'm in for all of that. You know, it doesn't mean that uh, intellectually I can't do anything else. Mm. You know, it doesn't mean that at all. However, I do like sports, but it does have that misconception. A lot of people don't understand. Like, oh, this guy is just watching uh, football. He's one of those guys, like you know, cheeseheads. Yeah. Puts on the hat, drinks his beer, gets hammered. That's a. It's an odd stereotype. It's not the worst stereotype though. No. But I get what you're saying with that. Yeah. yeah. And what I one of the things I like about sports too is how they how they intensify time. It's one of the things I really enjoy having is the um, the urgency or the desperation behind time at and at the end of games. There's ten seconds left. There's yeah. You're down by two. You have the three. How they line. run the clock yeah. or they pass the clock for football or yeah. like even in soccer they have strategic uh, substitutions to waste time to waste or to like catch up in hockey too like those seconds. It's just crazy. I, I like, that, I, like I said, I like that intensity, that yeah. last, the drama. Yeah. I guess that's the best way to put it. And I love a good Cinderella story. Yeah. The comeback. Come, I think it's entertaining. Yeah. I don't know why that would be more um, kind of uh, intellectually uh, disadvantaged, uh, an intellect disadvantaged compared to other things as a soap opera, for example. Yeah. Or like how does it hurt you by watching sports? Now, an obsession is a different story, right? Once you start getting obsessed with something. But uh, you're right about that that stigma of if they find out you like football, they're like, oh, JC just wants to fucking yell at, uh, at the screen. I do. Uh, I still do. I still do. <laughs> I, but I do more than that. Yeah. I yell a lot at the screen, but I do more than just that. I also tweet angrily, too. Oh, okay. That's, you know what the bad thing is, I think? Because social media is so um, instant, yeah. you don't have time to cool down. Okay. So you could say something stupid, yeah. and you're like, fuck, if I had 10 minutes to think about that, I would not have tweeted that. Yeah. You know? That's the problem now. So you that's how easy it is to come off as a moron. Yeah. Of which I do on a regular basis, let me tell you. <laughs> I get intense about something, I tweet about it, I'm like, that was too much. This is this yeah. is gonna start a feud for nothing. <laughs> I, I like to to bet on sports. I like to bet on sports to make it intense. Because without it, I don't give a shit about certain a lot of the teams. People say that, but I don't agree with you. Okay. If it's my team, yeah, I give a shit no matter what. Oh like the Habs I don't have to bet. But football, I don't have a team. That's the thing. But if I you like don't have a team, football. Yeah, because then so what do you care? 
Yeah. But if it's your team, I also had a friend who would do the when opposite. I have money on it. It's my team now. M- my buddy I would always bet against his team. That's all he would do is bet against his team. Okay. And his logic was, if they lose, I'm happy I won money. Yeah. And if, if they win, even though I lost money, my team won. It's hard against the mind. It fucks with you. Yeah. Hard ag- it's hard against the mind. In a certain sense, what he's doing. Either he's happy with the heart or he's happy with the mind. He's in Toronto now. Okay. He's a bit of a weirdo. Okay. He's a bit of a good kid, but a bit of a weirdo. All right. Yeah, I, How so? Well, number one, you're going to understand this as a sports fan. Um, in two different sports, I've seen him switch teams. Okay. Switch teams midway through his life. To me, that's a no-no. no-no. He went from a hardcore Canadians fan to a Toronto Maple Leafs fan. Wow. Which, uh, not just because of the teams, not because of the rivalries. I've never heard that. How do you not love something that you grew up loving and then love yeah. the opposite of that? I get, I get a lot of frustration with the Habs often. But you're not going to go like a rival team. You no. can't. It's not in me. Same, same. I like the Devils. That's been my team right. growing up. As much as I want Montreal to win, it's my city. I don't love it like I love the Devils. I can't start liking that team, you know? Yeah. Um, so, uh, to me, that's part of the weird thing that he does is when he switched teams. He did the same thing in soccer. He switched teams. I was like, how the fuck does somebody do that? I can't do that. No. I only have yeah. a team in hockey, though. The Habs? Yeah. I, uh, uh, the other sports, I, I keep it open. You like the Nordiques? No. No? You don't want them to come back? I want them to come back. Because but you I'm hated Habs them. Man. Yeah, there we go. I like that. Yeah. The rivalry. But I, I don't hate them. I, I, I guess I was too young for that rivalry. I'm, my, my rivals are the, the Bruins. How big was the Nordiques Canadians rival? Because I didn't get to live through huge. it. I get to see it through video. Yeah. Um, well, there was a huge brawl on like Friday, uh, Vendredi Saint. Okay. There was a huge like, br- like full. Two Where? Benches. I think it was in Quebec. Okay. <laughs> uh, it was either in Quebec or in Montreal, obviously. And the benches cleared and yeah. just went nuts. Yeah. Vendredi Saint. Oh, this is amazing. Yeah. I knew they hate each other, but I never got to see like it was just before my time. Just before me getting into hockey, really. Yeah. So I didn't get to experience that rivalry. How old are you? I'm 30. Okay, I'm 34. Yeah, there so you go. So I, I lived it a bit. Yeah, very little, but too. But to me, it was Boston. It was always Boston. When I grew up, that's what it was. I remember yeah. uh, the Habs hating Boston, and the reason why they hated Boston was mostly because the Toronto Maple Leafs were not a competitive team, so it didn't really yeah, matter. Exactly. It was good for one night of and rivalry. And the other conference, too. Yeah, so it didn't. there was no reason for it to be that big. Yeah. Uh, then in high school, I guess uh, conference they're in the same conference. It became more of a rivalry, but still they they weren't a competitive team. I remember those uh, Corey Joseph days. Was it Corey? What's his name? Curtis. Curtis, Curtis. Curtis Joseph days uh, with his fucking saber tooth helmet, whatever the fuck he had. Yeah. Uh, when they were trying to do something, the Leafs. But then my Devils would fucking crush them, <laughs> and I loved it. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, no, I'm a I'm a sports guy too. I like uh, the certain yeah. sports that I uh, just really soccer, European soccer. I'm huge on that. Yeah, I played uh, university soccer. So Tell anyway, me about this. I uh, I played five years university soccer. I switched from hockey to soccer. I, I grew up playing hockey, um, and when I in, I played throughout high school in, in uh, for soccer. So it was summer, winter, summer, winter. And uh, when I entered university, I, I just picked up soccer year-round. But I, m- I missed hockey. Like, uh, my love was hockey. But I played soccer in university. Uh, the first year, I didn't. I played the last game. So I, I just trained with the team the whole year. And I got to dress the last three games. And the last game I played... How come? Uh, I didn't make the team. Okay. But I fought my way on to it at the end. The next year, I played a lot more and throughout... And, and yeah, it was uh, it was so fun. It was so intense that that um, that fall. Every fall was intense. It was you trained all summer with a like summer club team, yeah, senior, and then you'd go into that season with more and more responsibility as I went through my years. And uh, yeah, playing university sport was just amazing. Did yeah. you guys win anything? No, we, we weren't that good. <laughs> Did you make it close? Did you ever have one of these like uh, runs? We had, we had two seasons where we, we went pretty far in the playoffs, but we didn't never won anything. Well, you, you know, because you, you're a guy who's been playing sports. I know it, too. I know the bitter uh, sweetness of getting a team that shouldn't be doing anything, making it just far enough, but falling short at the yeah. end. It's happened to me, I think, uh, three times in hockey, uh, and it's it's brutal. But yeah. I wouldn't trade it for anything. It was still such a fun experience. Just yeah. the getting there, you know? It just sucked that same thing with me. We couldn't win a championship. My In Pee Wee, the second year, we won the provincial championship. Batham, second year, we won the provincial championship. And Midget, second year, 
we went in overtime, and I remember it vividly, digging the goalie and backhanding it, and he just stuck out his pad. Oh. And then on the next shift, they scored, and we lost. I remember Is it because you feel like if you had put that in, of we wouldn't have been there, well, and that's why you're was, guilty? It was overtime. It was overtime, but you feel a guilt? Yeah. You yeah. should. You there, should. I feel like, like you fucked over a lot. How many people were on your team? Well, a full team. So you ruined 30 lives at yeah, least yeah. there and their families and their yeah, family. I ruined. Just a terrible yeah. human being. Yeah. No, I, I had scored in the game earlier, but I didn't score that one. That's fucked, though. But that's yeah. where that bittersweet, you yeah. know what I mean? We, the love-hate relationship we have with sports. Yeah. But again, like I said, I wouldn't, even the, the down times, yeah. I wouldn't trade them because uh, there was a lot of learning. I feel like with sports, you learn. Like yeah. with my nephews, I like that they're involved, they're involved heavily in soccer uh, and they're pretty good. I like that they're into that because I feel like it teaches you discipline. It teaches you also teamwork. Yeah. Because in life, a, a lot of times, a lot of people like to go solo. Yeah. Um, but you need to understand how to work with people. Like, you could go a lot further if you learn how to respect people and help each other yeah. move forward. I, I learned a lot through it, and uh, I feel like comedy is close to it. Like, I, I made the transition from sp- being sports obsessed to comedy. Uh, that's the, There's a division in my life where... My five years of soccer ended. I left because I didn't know what to do with my life. I left. Uh, I went out west. I worked at a bunch of different jobs. And I started writing because of, of the solitude and because I, I hated these jobs. I just started writing. It wasn't even comedy. And uh, it's that transition. I wasn't playing sports anymore, so I didn't, have, I didn't belong to that anymore. So I was empty. Like, my identity was, like, I didn't know what I, what I was and... I was really digging. I was going to be a teacher, and I like, took a year off from school to figure things out. And I uh, started writing and bumped into an open mic, and I've been com- doing comedy since then. Now I'm curious. And there's a very, like, there's a transition between sports and comedy. It's what like two lives. What were you going to teach, by the way? Uh, I wanted to teach history. Oh, shit. Yeah. That's what I'm at. Nice. There we go. I don't teach. But uh, Concordia, like, that's like, what I took. Nice. History, I love history. Nice. Yeah. I, I wanted to teach history or like general. Uh, I, I was, I studied phys ed too, but I studied I feel like that would have been fun. And I wanted to teach like um, sec, secondary one and two. I felt like that was the age group where you really can shape them. I remember being a kid and those were the formative years. Yeah, that, that's true. High school. Beginning of high, yeah. It's like junior high, basically. The junior high years, I feel like that's when your mind is being molded and you're developing habits, you're picking a path. I feel like high school, it's not too late, but kids are already in a certain path. Either they're doing drugs or they're really into sports. They're really focusing on studying. They're really, they've chosen a path at that time. So it's harder to change. You have less of an impact because they're already in a route but in junior high they're they're still mold like they're still in the mold they're moldable moldable you can you yeah. can play with them like play-doh but you shouldn't play with them no 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 <laughs> it's frowned upon yeah <laughs> <laughs> but you, you know what i mean yeah, like they're yeah, still no, for, they're, they're you, you're actually going to educate you're actually going to make a difference yeah i had a conversation about teachers over the weekend the day either than when we played hockey it was either that night I had a long conversation about teachers uh, just in Canada because I don't exactly know how it works in the States, but about payment Mm. and how teachers are heavily underpaid for Mm. what they're actually producing to society, right? These are the people that take in any kid, you know, shit, it doesn't matter. They don't make this choice, right? Mm. And they're trying to shape them up to live and contribute to society. And yet, apart from the vacation, let's not talk about summer, but in general, the hours are kind of shit because you're there, there's kids, you have an off period here. What are you going to do with just one random hour off in your day? They're never you off. Go back? It's weird. During right? the year, they're never During off. During the year, they're doing shit. Their, um, th- their role is very important. And yet, it's such an insignificant uh, amount that we look at giving them in terms of compensation, monetary compensation. And we don't really talk about it enough. Like, it's not, hey, we're talking about education. Let's put more money in the school. Let's put more money in these fucking teachers' pockets. Mm. Right? Let's pay them a bit better yeah. so they're not as fucking stressed out. And you know what that would do as well? I don't want to cut you, but I that, that hear would it. also no. do that would attract like uh, strong, better people, higher better quality pe- people. Not that the teachers that are teaching right now are aren't 
great people. Do you want to say a lot of them are garbage? Because you can. No. <laughs> no. <laughs> not no. enough. But just like any job that's not... Like, if yeah. someone wants... It has the capacity of, like, becoming a doctor or becoming a dentist... And he wants to a, live that life. Yeah. And there's yeah. M- a lot more that it can attract him or her to that profession because it's so undervalued. It's so underpaid. So it's going to scare a lot of very, very brilliant minds. The re- the true teachers are still going to be there, and I know a lot of them. They're still going to be there, and they're still going to be teachers, regardless of those conditions. But I think we could attract a lot of brilliant minds to this profession if it was way better conditioned. I, I agree with you. I, I heavily agree with you. I, I think the importance of it, we kind of skip over a lot. We don't think about it, but... Um, if a teacher does the job correctly, you're going to create a person in society that's going to be able to fucking, you know, hold a job, mm. show up on time, uh, have critical thinking, yeah. pay their taxes, contribute. You know what I mean? You're going to you're gonna help society so much. Yeah. But if you have garbage shit, I don't even want to be there. The, the kids are passing through. Yeah. You're just fucking answer A, B, whatever, yeah. keep moving. It's a job. You're, yeah, it's just a that's job. It's the scariest thing. You, it's like a factory. It's like an assembly line yeah. of delinquents. That you're gonna be pushing out because I had teachers that were like that. Yeah. I had teachers that were just there to be there, yeah, and they couldn't care less. But at the same time, I was lucky because I had some really, I had a handful of stellar. We're talking about superstar teachers. Yeah, uh, I had one. I remember an English teacher in high school. Um, she happened to be Greek, but it, it didn't help at all. She was actually a bit harder on the Greek students to yeah. not show favoritism, which in a way kind of shows anti favorite It's the same thing. But uh, excellent fucking teacher. Yeah. One of the most brilliant minds. She's the one who got me into reading like reading as a hobby. Books, this and that. Uh, just an excellent mind and knew how to motivate kids. Yeah. Knew how to motivate you, wanted you to create something. She yeah. valued that, whatever you could come up with in your mind and put on paper. And uh, I had a couple of teachers like that that were just so good and I know that they shaped me and I still kind of thank them. You know, In the back of my mind, I know that they're responsible for certain things that I ended up doing. Whereas I had other teachers that I saw direct contribution to their behavior and how they turned other people I went to school with into fucking social delinquents now. Yeah. And sadly, we end up with these kind of situations because there's people that are still going to go in there because they just love it and they're good at what they do. Yeah. And there's a lot of people who they couldn't do something else and they're like, oh, well, uh, this fits my, it's you know. Stable. And then you have these fucking billion people that could have been the best fucking teachers and they're like, shit, I don't want to struggle my whole life. Yeah. Exactly. It's a... Uh but it would be hard to pay so many people very good. Like True. as a society. I mean, and other societies really value... Like you can't, put, like we a, could you can't put a price on that because it generates better citizens. You can't put a price, but I feel like there are places where we can cut. For example, in Canada, I know that Justin Trudeau, just, uh, what, a week ago, they, they're spending, what is it, $5 million or more on an ice rink? Right across the street from uh, an outdoor oh, rink, yeah. right across the street from Parliament for the game the, uh, between the Habs and the. Is Sands. that what it's for? Because yeah. I heard it's it's going to be there for, for the just 24, four, 24 days, and then it's out. Yeah, it's for that game. And the government's paying for it. Yeah, that doesn't make they any shouldn't, sense. Shouldn't it shouldn't, be the NHL? Shouldn't it be a private company if that's the reason? So like five million dollars there. I'm just giving an example. So there is money that's being frivolously spent, yeah. wasted rather. Um, why not? put it in those kind of, you know, um, but departments. The money that that's going to generate, though, because that outdoor game is going to attract a lot of people to the city, and yeah. they're going to spend a lot of money in the city. But equally, why are they responsible yeah. for a private... Because if I'm the NHL, yeah. I know I'm going to make my money back. Yeah, It's my contribution to build something of the sort. I agree. Where, well, why would the government be responsible for that? They could take that I money, put it somewhere no else. Idea. And also, if they're going to make more money... And that might it. not be that rink. It might it, be it pro- I don't think it's that rink. Because yeah. from what I understood from what they said is it's only going to be open for 24 days and people are allowed to skate on it, but you need to make you need to buy tickets two days in advance or something. It's just it's a, f- it's a waste of money. It's a waste yeah. of money considering that we're, we're not in a situation to, uh, to spend like that. Yeah. You know, our budget isn't balanced, right? We're in the deficit right now pretty heavily from what I understand. Um, we have better, more important places to spend Priorities, that money. yeah. Priorities, I don't know. But we're, we're from Quebec, so nothing works. We're used to shit just not balancing out and not working. From New Brunswick, so yeah. <laughs> How is it over there? For that aspect? Yeah, corruption. Oh, the province is owned by a company. There's a Irving. That There's a few gas stations in Quebec that are Irvings, but in New Brunswick, Irving owns the province. They own the newspapers. What? They own, like, all the companies. Like, everything... 
is owned. It's it's crazy. How the yeah. fuck does that work? They they just does, just a very very wealthy family. It's does like everybody the, work at uh, an Irving company? Like a no, there's a lot of other jobs, but um, there's a lot of people that work directly for Irving. Yeah. Oh wow! And uh, New Brunswick is is huge for uh, call centers because of the it's a hub. Like it's very centralized for that aspect of the population, and it prides itself on bilingualism. So a lot of call centers come to the uh, Moncton region because of they can hire a lot of bilingual workers. Interesting. Yeah. So I they didn't really know that put. That's one of the biggest things that they put emphasis on the bilingualism. We still have. Uh, there are a lot of towns in North America actually that are. They basically they're they're, they're state afloat. They yeah. stay afloat by one corp. I know that Bristol, Connecticut. I've been there at ESPN. Dude, ESPN probably employs ninety five percent of Bristol. Yeah. It is like campuses. It's so big. There's so many people working there. Yeah. And that's all there is around. There's a couple of bars, some stores, but that's the main fucking wow. business. And it's huge. It's huge ESPN down there. So same thing, Bristol, Connecticut, if they would get rid of uh, ESPN studios, whoa, there's no way those people are going to live there. What are you going to do? Wow. To move to Hartford or yeah. some other place. Is it far from Hartford? Uh, no, because I... Th- did I fly into Harvard and then drove? I don't remember. But I don't think it's that far from Harvard. Maybe an hour, an hour. Hartford or Harvard? Hartf- Hartford. Okay. No, Harvard, it's far from Harvard. It's Harvard, Harvard is Harvard down is here. in Massachusetts. Yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah. Have you been, uh, yeah. have you done comedy in the States? I've done comedy in the States mostly in LA. LA, right? Uh, yeah. yeah. I, like the com- I like the comedy there a lot more than I do in, uh, let's say, I don't know, the t- towns that are around here apart from Montreal. I love doing it in Montreal. Yeah. Uh, but in the states, I find like uh, they're ready for comedy. Yeah. They're one of the best experiences I had was there at the, the Ice House in Pasadena. Yeah. Number one, the way the club is built, it's made for comedy. Okay. It was I don't know like the way the laughs were staying in and it was like layered the way people are, are seated. It yeah. was very interesting. And uh, the laughs stay in. It's like they built it knowing this is just for comedy. Let me make maximize the enjoyment on a comedy show, right? Whereas here, a lot of people will just build clubs. Yeah. This is a comedy club now. But it's really not like uh, you know conducive to comedy. Yeah. It's not the ceilings are too high or there's too many lights. Yeah. You know, it's not. And people don't realize that, but there's a lot of little comfort uh, zones that you got to find on a person so they can be comfortable to laugh among strangers. One of the things that you learn is to keep the lights low on the crowd. Yeah. The audience needs to be dark amongst themselves so that they don't feel like they're being looked at by their neighbors. So judged. they're comfortable. Yeah, judge. So they're comfortable to laugh. Like the comedyness here does that now. It's darker in in the audience. Yeah. So they feel comfortable to laugh so the laughs will pop you know um sound man one sound man told me that they put music before the shows right the, he said five minutes before the announcement of the mc he brings up the level of the volume just a bit so that people don't notice but they start talking louder so they're more expressive so oh. they're ready to laugh more like they but they they don't notice it See, I, I never heard of that, and yeah. it actually makes sense, but these little, there's a lot of people that understand this to a science. Yeah. They know how to work a room, and I mean, before putting even a comic on there, just yeah. how the lights should be, how, you, like you said, the music should kind be right before, the kind of music. This kind of stuff's important. Yeah, but that's why, because you were asking if I've performed anywhere else. Yeah, in the States. Uh, I mean, where else would I go? The way I do comedy is very Americanized, right? It's in a, So I don't know if I'd have mass appeal in Greece. They don't really do stand up. But uh their comedy there is more the theatrical. Acropolis. Yeah, they do there's a lot of like one man shows, there's a lot of famous I don't know if I'm going to call them comedians, but uh comedy they, they do a lot of satirical stuff and they talk about politics and they're really really funny. But the w- the way Greeks do comedy and the way they're making fun of is is um that dimension is very different from the way North American stand up is. North American stand up works here, it works in England. Um, and there's a lot of there's some Scandinavian countries that really adopted it as well. France, because you know, because of Quebec, it works the same way. They like that kind of that kind of comedy, um, just anecdotal stuff. Yeah, they like that. It's not the same in Greece. They have comedy, but it, they do it in a different platform. The platform is way different. Okay. Than stand up. I, I went to a stand up in Athens. They had I don't know if it was a real club or they were just calling it a comedy club, but it was I don't know. It was more like spoken word. Okay. Poetry. It was weird. It wasn't. Uh, huh. It wasn't what I thought it was when I got there. Shit. Yeah. So you at least have that. You got two languages. You yeah. could go to uh you could go to France. Yeah. The States. Yeah, if I go to Europe, there's a lot of places where you can do English. 
even in Paris, there's an English uh, scene. Not scene, but there's like two or three places where you can do English. Really? And uh, a lot of the Parisian comedians come to Montreal. And a lot of the Montrealers have been to go into Paris and there's an exchange. We're like cousins. This is interesting. And uh, when they come, they told us that they, they start, they're starting to come a lot more because Sugar Sammy went and uh, Louis José Wood went and a few comics from here went and really dominated. And now they're, they're saying that our level is higher than theirs. That's what they're saying. I'm not. Well, we, uh, with the names that you just mentioned, are strong fucking comics. So yeah. we, they did get some fucking yeah. powerhouses. But when they come and they they discover like n- the newer acts, they're saying like the level. Uh, we've been, we've been working on having a lot of nights too. Like uh, in Montreal, in French, you can play, three, four times if you want, in an in one night. In one night, yeah, you can't do that yet on the English scene here. So you you're getting better because you're playing more. You could do that in New York or in LA. Yeah, exactly. That's why those comics are strong. Yeah. Because they play a lot. It's you put two comics that have the same amount of talent, and you make one play f- fifteen times a week, compared to like four times. He's gonna get. He's good. gonna get good. He's gonna get all the muscles, and it's like going to the gym. You, the more you do it, the better, the more in shape you become. I also feel like because we've been developing some really good comics yeah like they'll go on the, they're very um stable when they go on yeah um it kind of forces everybody else around to step up their game yeah it's like shit if i want stage time i need to be able to compete yeah. i need to be at that level yeah so i always find that the better people around you are whether you like it or not there's two options either you fucking bow out say i can't do that yeah or it forces you to yeah, really push to your limits, up. step it up. Either r- the writing, yeah. uh, it c- sometimes the writing's amazing. It's the it's the performance that's not there, but you're gonna tweak that because yeah. you want to get to that level. That's why I always find that the better people are doing around you, that's a good fucking sign. Because if you're as good as you think you are, you're gonna step up your game. It's gonna become natural to you. Yeah. You have no. It's like in sports when you're down, yeah. right? Naturally, if you're an a- you're a competitor, you're an you athlete. Wanna team. You want to make the team and you want to come back. So if you're down by two goals, some people give up. Yeah. You don't want those people on your team. No. But those people that are going to fight harder. They're going to run after everything. They're going to chase every ball. Yeah. They're going to slide. Those are the guys that, same thing in comedy, yeah. they're the ones that just get better. The better people are around them, the better they become. And then they don't even realize it. And one day they're like, holy shit, this half hour is great, right? Yeah. But if I stuck around just shitty comics and shitty clubs and mm. shit, I wouldn't have been this good because I wouldn't have had to. I could have been mediocre yeah. and I would have stood out. And still work. Still work. I would have stood But when you're around Sugar Sammy's, you have Joey Elias, it's like, you got to work. Yeah. You have to put in the effort. You do. Yeah, Absolutely. So I, I do notice that. That's why I like it when um, there's there's a name from here that's becoming bigger and bigger. Because then people right away, they wake up. They're like, oh, shit, I got I to gotta shake it up. I got to do something. And it helps. Because then the next person, yeah. an open micer that saw that person, is going to be like, oh, that's the level I need to be to be on the weekend. And it says it's possible. What do you mean? also says. Oh, because, yeah, because you see a person making see it. Yeah. someone that you've seen grow i like seeing that i like seeing people i've seen in their beginnings accomplish something because i i know where it's coming from yeah i like seeing the evolution too i've seen a cut co- here actually we've had um i know that a lot of us leave and go to mostly toronto i yeah. guess to but even like guido uh guido and andrew searles they went they left uh, they're in la right now um i like seeing that i like it when they're like you know what the, this pond is too small for me yeah uh, let me go try my craft somewhere else. And it's kind of like um, uh, they graduated. Yeah. And they're like, okay, I've done what I had to do here in this city. Let me go try it here where uh, maybe people don't know you, so you have to work again from the bottom, build that rapport, let let the audience trust you. Yeah. Um, the ladder is quicker, but it is starting from the bottom. Yeah. But yeah. It, it obviously quicker because you have the skill set. You're a yeah. comedian by that point. But uh, I like it when I see that too. Yeah, same thing. Same thing. And also you kind of spread the quality around, and the name of the city. So now I know there's a lot of Montreal comics that are in Toronto. They're doing well. That also looks good for the scene on one way. Like, hey, look at what Montreal's producing. Yeah. You know, like, yeah, they're Toronto comics now, but that's where they came from. Yeah. You know, and maybe it'll shine a light on this city. Same thing with Toronto comics. I've seen a lot of Toronto comics that come over. They do, like, weekends at the Comedy Nest. F- some really good fucking comics. Yeah. Some really good comics that should maybe get a bit more exposure. Um, and hopefully by this whole exchange... Kind of like what you said, the right people see them, the right people put them on, and they become a bit more of household names. Because we do have trouble with that in Canada. Yeah, it's hard for good 
uh, comedians to get to that level of fame, at least, well, of notoriety. I, that's a good thing, too, though, for the talent, because Canada has produced a lot of great comedic talent around the world, especially in the States. <coughs> But that's the But thing. I They have the to fact, leave. I think, I think the fact that it's tougher makes it not more worthwhile, but it makes it... Uh, well, it forces them to, to grind, it. and like it forces you to you're get out. You're never in a comfortable zone. You're never in a... Because you have to get out. You reach... It's kind of like what you said about getting the papers ready to go to the States. You reach uh, the ceiling, yeah. and then you're like, fuck, I'm at this level now. I know I could do more, and, but this is it. I've, I've beaten every level here. I need to do something else. So it forces you kind of to go in, uh, in into the States, but wouldn't it also be good if Canada had a strong enough... A platform for them, whether it would be TV, web, or whatever, for them, t if they chose to, to not have to leave. But I feel with the web, it's, n it's like that now. Because the web, you can be anywhere. Like this show. Yeah. That's true, yeah. Exactly like this show. That's a nice way to get around it and put it but, right but on it the pinpoint. Yeah. But it's completely accurate. Yeah. I, I remember when I first started podcasting in 2010, Uh, we started getting messages and started getting listeners from um, San Jose, California. Okay. This was before I had ever stepped foot in California. It had, had nothing to do with me. It was, it was just by odds, looking for podcasts. They find one thing, they find another. And it clicked to us. We're like, Jesus, this changes the game around so much. That's people that would have never heard of us. You know, we we're talking about complete local topics and yeah. just, and bam, they tuned in, they found us, and it, it made the world just that much smaller. You know, yeah, and it, your network grows. Exactly, it it, it is. A, we do live in interesting times It's for so artists. You can, like, uh, I've I've heard about like the Iceland scene. What? There, yeah, there's this comedian in Iceland who does drawings. So I, I kind of figured out who he was through his dra drawings, and then I learned that he was a comedian. Did it in English, so I just saw a set from the internet. But it's Iceland, it's so far, it's so isolated. But because of the internet, I discovered this unknown comedian i've done that i with don't know english. what his name is but i i discovered him i've seen uh english comedians because of because of youtube right yeah. you follow, that i never heard of and they're hilarious like they're, they're they're at a good level to be in north america right to be famous in north america and yet i had never heard of them but you know from video to video you're looking at you know when you get into that fucking wormhole in uh on youtube yeah when you spend an hour and you go from and it's happened to, i've also seen a couple of um african Like South, a like Africa, uh, real Africa yeah. comedians that are still doing it around Africa and in Europe. They're yeah. not in North America, but they're fucking hilarious. Nice. And again, would I have ever heard of these people without the internet? Never. Exactly. Never. It's yeah, you're right. It is. Uh, it's like that for every field, but it's like that for our field now. So, do you feel like people who make excuses and don't step out of the box and don't try to accomplish something now? It's kind of. Uh, a little pathetic because like you have everything at your disposal you have uh, social media you have uh, the ability to put up videos podcasting whatever you want and yet you're still like oh it's too big i can't do it when it's never really been easier to market yourself or to it's get out it's never been easier but there's never been so many that's true too and to come back to teaching that was one of the, my main focuses is i wanted to teach these kids To learn how to learn because if you can learn a subject that you don't really like and you can convince them that even if they don't like it let me let's learn together how you can master this subject that you don't like and in exchange later on in life a subject that you love and you're passionate about if you learn how to learn early you'll learn how to learn exactly what you want to do and anything you want to do If you're good at learning, I think it's important to make them understand that you have to learn how to learn. Because you and then you apply those skills to something you actually love. Yeah. And you get so much in return for it. Exactly. Because you're willing to put in the extra. Yeah. Because now you love it. I, I've I've thought about that even for myself sometimes. While well, I would put effort into something that it was kind of you have to do it right. Yeah. And then I would be like, you know what though, fuck that shit. Because I'm going to spend twice as much time uh, doing you know X thing, going stand up, doing something else. Uh, and I'll be happy for it. You know, I know how yeah. to do this. I'm going to apply it at another part of my life. I've, I've tried to teach myself how to create more. Like, that's my motor in a, as a comedian. Like, going on stage is the fun part, but everything before it, like how you prepare for that new number, that new bit, that 
how you've fiddled things together. I think that's the motor of being a comedian. And the, the stage part, I think you get from experience, but the rest, like how you create your content, I try to learn how to generate content from reading articles on creativity, reading articles on other writers in other fields, like novel writers and just other jobs that I learn from. I learn from other comedians, of course, but I feel that you're learning so much with the internet. Like you said, we're in a great era where we have access to all of this. And I was reading an article on the internet of how bad having access to all this is for <laughs> creativity. Yeah. Because <laughs> you're, you, cr being creative really requires being alone in a room with no Wi-Fi, just a pen and paper. And thinking. And just like daydreaming and thinking. Do you have, because I think you might, uh, I, I do a lot. Do you ever have these epiphanies where uh, when you're completely sold, let's say you're sleeping in the middle of the night. Yeah. Your brain starts working, it won't, and then you'll just get up. You're like, "Holy shit, I gotta write this down," yeah. and it just comes to you in that solitude. It happens to me a lot, yeah. and I get my best stuff out of that, where my brain just stops thinking about anything else. Yeah. It starts putting pieces together, yeah. and it's like, "Here, it's so fucking obvious. Take it, take it." Exactly. You know that that I like those kind of. I think that happens because you work hard the rest of the time. I think it wouldn't happen like that if you didn't work on it during the day. You're working, you're working, you're working. It's not gonna give you the result when you're working. But if you didn't work, it would never give you the result. Because it would never be on. You, that gear was, yeah. wouldn't you, have you, been you working. You really di you digged and you digged and then you let it sit. There's a huge power of the subconscious in creation. Well, uh, I'll, I'll give you an example of how I use, uh, for example, YouTube. Yeah. Um, so I was doing podcast. Th this podcast is relatively new. But before that, I had a, uh, the 4-H podcast and we're doing it since 2010. And the one thing we never did was have video okay. and go on YouTube. So I've been talking with a lot of people who are on YouTube, and they all found it stupid that I had never uh, sat down, put it, and I didn't know how, right? So, uh, you know, we invested, we got some cameras now, and I said, so for this podcast now, it's going to be strictly, it's going to be available on iTunes, but it's also going to come out every episode on YouTube, right? I found myself with a dilemma. I don't know how to do this. How am I going to edit these videos? How got the software, went on YouTube, and I learned from people who were in Sri Lanka, from what I understand. They were teaching me with tutorials, and I fucking learned, and I sat there for hours, oh, this is how I do this, this is how I do that. And those tutorials in one week yeah. taught me how to do all this better than a fucking six-month class would have because I was actually stopping, seeing what they were doing. You're going at your own pace. Going at my own pace. I would learn, and then I realized that the new stuff I was learning quicker. I was learning quicker and quicker, and I was getting more comfortable with it. But I, I took the time to not get overwhelmed. In the beginning, I was like, oh, my God, yeah. two different, what's, what's pre and pro? And then there's After Effects. I got to create this. And what is a layer? What's this? What's Photoshop? You know, like, how do I use it? Just sat there, took it for what it was, step by step, and I learned how to do it within about a week, a week and a half. I was like, you know what? Fuck it. Now I'm committing. I'm going to put up these fucking videos. Um, I, I put in the work to learn how to do it. I'm going to edit it put them up there but i learned it from that meeting i didn't have that before right now we're in an age where there's no excuse anything i bet you if i wanted to work on my car which again i don't know anything about yeah i could probably go on youtube yeah. and find 10 videos on the same topic of i don't know uh changing a tire changing I, this I change a tire like that from youtube yeah it is great yeah. you just have to go out there and you could do it all yourself you could find these tutorials and they, they're really helpful all these people go into serious detail yeah they'll go Cooking. back for you cooking I've learned a lot of stuff off YouTube. Yeah. Cooking cool ass recipes. Yeah. Yeah. And my, my girlfriend's huge into uh, Instagram. She okay. She likes to post her recipes. So I'm eating amazing. Like Because she wants to make it to show it. Yeah. <laughs> but <laughs> she's always been passionate about, uh, cooking. about cooking. And, and I really, I, I participate. Obviously. So now. You get to eat it. I get to eat it, but I, I now could do a lot of things. I learned a lot from her. But she. Because of the internet, we make a lot more like different things. Because we probably get in a certain routine when we'd have like twelve recipes or something. But it's really not like that. Like she wants to try new things. She wants to impress <laughs> on Instagram. But, but she's really good, and she's really good getting good at the photography of it. Ah, like, you see she's like learning a new angle. skill. Yeah, yeah. There's a, there's a guy uh, that posts videos on YouTube too about how to take the best Instagram photos uh, when you're taking for food and stuff like put an object in front of it and all yeah. this and the and lighting the angle yeah I don't care like if you see my Instagram stuff they're all garbage they're they're not taken properly it's mostly me yelling at stuff uh, but because that's not where my um, passion is yeah. you know 
Uh, but I definitely see such a, it's kind of like what you just said. You could be sitting there with your girlfriend and it's uh, 630 in the PM. And you're like, you know, what? I don't know what I have. Like the fridge is full, but I don't know what we should make. You're like, you know, let's try something new. We'll go on YouTube. They'll fucking show us how to take our ingredients yeah. and make something completely brand new. Mm. Half hour, an hour, depending on what you're deciding to make. You've made something brand new. Yeah. Out of fucking. Yeah. You can have air. restaurant quality. Amazing. It's, it's, that's what I'm saying is like we top live. Top notch restaurant. Top notch stuff. Yeah. We live in that age now where you can. Do anything, you know what I mean? Like anything's possible. You have this learning ability yeah. that's so um, kind of direct to you and so, so editable to your pace. Yeah. That's the other thing. It's not somebody over the phone. It's not a list they give you and you got to interpret. It's you can see somebody going through the exact motions that you need to make so you could repeat them yeah. and learn through that. You're like, oh, this is what he means. Yeah. Oh, it's much easier than reading it out of a book. Yeah. or of a li- Like I said, I learned how to video edit in less than a week. Yeah. based on these tutorials wow. and amazing stuff these guys were really detailed yeah. they're like no that's not what you need the crop tool and you need this and uh, yeah. be careful the formats I'm like oh the formats let me learn about the formats <laughs> YouTube needs this and, and I learned it off these people and, and they're doing it for they're just putting them up there some people don't make any money off it they just like sharing the knowledge Yeah. so I subscribe as a support I'm like I'll like and subscribe because you helped me learn something I, I, I think I learned one of the things that's the opposite of the internet through the internet. I, uh, I did a lot of research. Yesterday, I was, I don't know why, but I, I felt like hermiting. I do that sometimes. And uh, I, I researched hermits. Like the crab? No, the hermits. Or the people. The people. And I discovered a Vice video on YouTube about a guy who's been living in the s- middle of Chile alone for the last 40 years. and they He built his house? From a boat scrap. Yeah, I, th- I think I've seen this on. Yeah. I think I saw this on a plane ride. I think I saw that vice yeah. video on a plane. Yeah, and he's living alone. And this is the opposite of all this technology. He's living like he's getting newspapers every like six months, and he reads everything to try to keep up with the world. He listens to the radio, and he's well informed. And he's just he's living in how like well boat informed scraps. can can a well, guy living in boat scraps. He's not super. He's like not the most knowledgeable person in the world about politics and stuff. But better that way. But yeah, he and people. They say that people hermit for uh, religious reasons and to rebel against uh, society. Those are kind of two drastically different things. One yeah. is for the establishment. One is not. Yeah. So I don't know which well, is for wi- spirituality more than. Religion. Yeah, because spiritual, I could see that. Because I, I could see some. I don't know if you'd rebel against society if you're rebelling against society by doing that. But by, I could definitely see. It, yeah, I could by, see the by advantage. By saying like, I don't want to be any part of this, and you're going away from it. I could respect that because it takes a lot, especially if you grew up in that environment and you had everything accessible to you. Yeah. For you to be that committed to be able to give everything up, I respect that level of commitment because I don't think. Even though I, I always think, ah, maybe one day I got to go to the suburbs, get the fuck out of the city. I've been in the city my whole life. Even at that, I think it's a village for me, going to the suburbs. In, in yeah. the back of my mind, I think that's a village life. So I can't even begin to imagine building a house out of boat scraps yeah. and getting newspapers and every six months. He's fishing and he's getting things from boats. He goes on horse rides to like go get some food and yeah. He's... L- some of the, him I understand because at least he's living it. Yeah. This is, I've decided this is my life now. What I don't understand is people that have money and they pay to go on these giant camping trips where they sleep outside. It's like you're paying money to live like the crackheads in my neighborhood. Yeah. You know what I mean? Fucking go home. You have a toilet bowl. G- give me some money. I'll, I'll show you. Yeah. But it's like, oh, you don't understand. We, you know, we had to f- get our own food for, the, uh, yeah. for that whole week and we were wet and we were sleeping outside. It's like, yeah, you know who else sleeps like that? Steve, who lives outside in the box yeah. <laughs> down the street, he does the exact same fucking thing. You know, yeah. why would you pay money to live like Steve? Just smoke some crack. That's how Steve got into this. Yeah. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> it is. It is interesting though. You could do. That. I would never be able to just. I want to go offline a lot, but not to that level mm. of changing my whole uh, I lifestyle. Th- I grew up uh, in the Maritimes too, eh? so being in the city for me sometimes is very. Um, it chokes me a bit. Is it overwhelming? It's overwhelming, and, and there's something about growing next to the sea that's uh, very, it's a part of you. Mm. Like, just everybody, even from the city, 
loves to look out into the ocean and not yeah. seeing anything at the horizon. There's something about that for people who are outside from it, but for when you've come from there, it's like necess it's a necessity. So when I go back and I see that, uh, I'm relieved. Greeks, we have that too. Yeah. Um, a lot, actually. We miss the, not just swimming in the beaches, but we miss looking out and seeing that. You're looking out, yeah. And uh, a lot of us notice it when we go back to Greece. Yeah. Just the feeling of like, oh, man. Because it's, uh, it's a lifestyle, right? It's a completely different mm -hmm. mindset. It's a different way that they think over there. And just the tranquil. They're much calmer about serious subjects. Yeah. They don't take it as seriously. They see life uh, a lot differently, in a better way. I mean, mm -hmm. uh, and I like that. I like that peacefulness. I like looking out and seeing the water, seeing the mountains, yeah. and being like, "Yeah, there's other stuff out here more important than you know thinking about." Oh shit, what about these bills? Oh, I gotta make it there at nine o'clock. All that yeah. they they live it differently, and that's always a pre when I go down there, I really appreciate it. I kind of centers me again. Yeah, I reset my clock. And I'm like, "All right, now I'm ready to go back to North America and do the North American thing." But every once in a while, I need to go back to Greece, recharge those batteries. Yeah, and then come back. I have that for the Maritimes. It's not that far, but it's still. I, in the first days I'm there, I, it it doesn't do that. But if I stay there long enough, then I start recharging. Yeah, and you get I sucked back, right back in. And yeah. I love coming back to Montreal too. Like I love this city. Same. I, I grew up like there's yeah. a lot of problems here, as we know. Hello, bonjour or bonjour hi. Bonjour hi. Yeah. Um, there's a lot of problems here, but I do love it. But there are a lot of problems. Like this whole bonjour hi hi is an irritant. You know what's an irritant? The way this whole fucking province is being run, that's an irritant. That's how people are getting irritated. Not because you're saying bonjour, hi. Yeah. I don't care either way. Yeah. Normally, I accommodate the people that uh, are selling me stuff. I accommodate them. If I hear that they're speaking English, but they have a bit of an accent, I'll switch to French to make them comfortable. Yeah. Same thing if I'm speaking French, because I just assume, and I hear that they're just English trying to speak French, I'll switch to English. Yeah. Even though it should be the other way around, it should be the people at the cash that accommodate to us. Yeah. I don't mind. I speak both I languages. I, I want to make you comfortable. Just give me my coffee, you know? Yeah. So I'll switch to tell me that it is irritating yeah. for for uh, me to be greeted with either one, right? Yeah. I have to be greeted just with French. That's a little fucked up. Who yeah. are you to make that decision? You don't know what irritates me. But, and one of the things about New Brunswick and bilingualism is, yeah, it's legally a bilingual province, but I feel like um, French people, pres we preserve our language not through laws, but through pride. There we go. To pride of speaking. It, w it won't die. I, I'd rather be proud of it than forced to do it. I've, I've made that argument before. I've discussed how in Quebec, um, it's been said many times that the language laws are put in place to preserve, right? And they're very aggressive. They'll find restaurants for menus. The problem with doing that is if you keep telling somebody, hey, what you're speaking now is wrong. This is the right way to do it. You agitate them. They don't embrace the culture. What they do is they regress. They make subcultures, right? They have their own communities. They make subcultures. And they're like, no, we got to keep what's ours because these people are being oppressive, right? And you're not helping. You're endangering the culture. However, if you're inclusive and you're like, this is Quebec. We speak English. We speak French, this and that. You have these two options. It's beautiful yeah. because of it. People embrace it more. They're more proud of it. Mm -hmm. They want to show it off. Like, look, I speak French too. And look, my sign. Because they want me part of the culture. They want to share it. They're like, this is a unique thing here. Yeah. They don't feel like somebody has a gun over their head. Yeah. And here I find that we do it backwards. Being rude to restaurant owners or just yeah. being, hey, uh, you can't remember that guy who wasn't letting people in the Metro tourists because they were speaking English. They didn't know. Like, I need one ticket. It's like, here, it's in French. He was telling them, right, in, in Quebec. You're just making people not want to come visit here. You're like, what the fuck? This guy's rude. Uh, I'm from New York. I don't speak French, right? And the people who do live here, you're not helping them embrace it because there's a lot of beauty here, especially in the culture that people by default would love. You know what I mean? Yeah. And they'd be like, fuck, I want to be part of this. I want to, you know, I want to go back home to whatever country I'm from and tell them, I, mean, I get to speak this language, this is where I'm from, this is what we do there. You don't want them to be going back home and being like, ugh, us, uh, forget the economy. Yeah. They're complaining because somebody said hello to me. Right, it's a little ridiculous, and then people regress a bit. They're like, "No, fuck it, I don't want to speak French because of this." And then on the other side, it's the same thing. They're like, "Well, fuck them, I don't want to speak English because they're, you know, they're not yeah. respecting me." They're creating. You're creating a tension that shouldn't even be there. Because mm. to me, it seems completely logical to want my kids to want to, to speak many languages. I want them to speak English. I want them to speak French. If they can learn Italian, if they can learn fucking Japanese, yeah. fucking learn it. Yeah. Learn any language you can. There's different people out there. Yeah. You're gonna go to different countries, and you're gonna widen your your mind. It can't hurt you in any way. No. It could you could only benefit like from learning learn, different languages. When you learn a new language, it doesn't push the other one out. It 
impo- it does the complete opposite. It actually also lets you embrace things differently because you understand them differently. Yeah. Right now, if you translate uh, something in Japanese to yeah. me, because I know Japanese culture is big here too, like anime, this and that, it's huge yeah. right now. Uh, I don't speak Japanese. Uh, I do appreciate uh, anime, video games, I love that stuff. But I know that if I could speak Japanese and I would understand how they're trying to relay their messages and I would understand the language, I would appreciate it more. Be like, oh, that's what that word means. Because I know for me in Greek, it's hard for me sometimes to translate to people what a Greek text or what a Greek movie is really saying. It's They don't directly translate to English. Mm. And I'm like, fuck, man, if only you could understand understand what this song is saying or what this video is, you'd get it, you know, you'd really appreciate it more. So understanding a language only opens those doors up for you to appreciate other things and open your hori- bright on your horizons, rather. Um, and widen your circle. You know what I mean? Yep. You get to go to another country, you get to go to Mexico, you get to go to Spain, you speak Spanish, you're comfortable there. Yeah. You don't look like the idiots, like, hey, uh, what the fuck? Yeah. What the fuck? Uh, cerveza? <laughs> uh, una cerveza? Could you imagine, like, you know three words yeah. and you go to Mexico? Fucking take full advantage of you. <laughs> oh, yeah, they, they have. <laughs> yeah, what happened to you? No, no, I, they didn't take advantage of me, but I, I understand what you mean. I, I tried, when I'm there, I try to really pick it up and I, I don't but I really try to sort of immerse myself in their language I, I forget it like two weeks later but when I'm there I try to I spoke Spanish you, in you, high school you watch the TV at night you know you try to pick it you up you try like to pick uh, yeah in high school I knew how to I took a Spanish class I wasn't good at it but because of friends that I had El yeah. Salvadorians mostly I picked it up and I was able to have conversations like uh, where we went for lunch what time is it oh you did this this week like I was able to speak it yeah. then I stopped practicing it yeah. And I didn't. But case, if we go back to the root of it here, what we were saying, um, we're fighting over nonsense. Because yeah. I don't see it as a legitimate you, argument. You know what the argument is, though? What's I, the I mean, I'm, I'm from outside. I'm a, My first language is French. So I have pride about being Francophone. It's my mother's tongue. My mother tongue. Yeah, it's and you should. It's also my mo- mother's tongue. But um, I think Quebec especially is that they're in North America the only state that's fully French, with the exception of Montreal, that's it's got a percentage of ang- Anglophone. And, yeah. then, and then you have uh, immigration that's bringing in other cultures and other languages. But it's the only state that's officially French. Like, I'm from a state that's both, but we're very small. So they're, they're big enough that they want to protect that because they, f- they feel that they can lose it within a few generations. But here's the thing. Here's my... Because I'm all for them protecting it. What yeah. I'm saying is the strategy they're using to protect it. Because the only oh, way to protect it now, agree. there's there's a lot of uh, new people coming in. There's a lot of... So you have two ways of going about it. One is you try to force it down people's throats and a huge percentage is going to grow resentful and not carry the culture. Yeah. Or two, have them Im- fall in love with it to yeah, the point pride. where you don't have to tell them. They're fucking proud. Yeah. When they say where you're from, the first thing is like, I'm from Quebec. Yeah. You could do that, though, because there's a lot to be proud of here. But instead, they go the opposite route. And the second you cause that resentment, the second you make that, you draw that line of yeah. us or them, yeah. a lot of people, just because you gave them the ultimatum, they're like, well, fuck you then. Not us, I'm them. Because you gave them the ultimatum. For certain people like me, because I was born here and I grew up, I take a lot of it with a grain of salt. I'm like, ah, it's just how we are around here. You know what I mean? I take a lot yeah. of it with a grain of salt. But I know how ugly it must look to people who come from the outside New immigrants or even tourists. I, yeah. I've had discussions downtown with tourists from New York. They're like, what the fuck is this? Like, I'm just asking for fucking directions, yeah. and I'm getting yelled at. Yeah. The, and I've seen it too. I went to buy comic books, one, uh, comic books uh, at Captain Quebec once, and I saw a guy yelling at another guy in French. He's like, oh, ça se passe en français. Yeah. Yeah. And the guy was just fucking scared. Just a tourist. He's like, holy shit. I asked the question. Why is he flipping out on me? Yeah. Like, you can't assume that because somebody's speaking another language they're trying to attack yours i'm not defending that oh obviously not like i'm I'm not defending that at all but i can see where they're coming from with the paranoia but like i said i feel like you you're gonna win a lot more with pride than with laws and forcing people yeah because people are gonna want to do it i find exactly so the resentment so we we agree on that yeah i I think and i do think because it's such a you it's a unique spot to be in where anybody from North America can go to a place that's French, let's yeah. say, right? Uh, it'll kind of build that, oh, let's go to Quebec. Yeah, they're nice there, you know? And th- then they'll try to pick up a few words, you know, yeah. and they'll try to speak French while they're here because they know this is not North America. There's something different about it because it is. Montreal does feel different than all the other cities. You know this. 
there's something about Montreal that's different. Um, but then when the locals, when you have the locals kind of split in the middle, you know, uh, and this is all, this isn't even done, the, the more you look into it, it's not even done by regular people. The resentment mostly comes from the government because they'll say stupid shit, right? Instead of saying shit, we need to educate people on, on, you know, what Quebec is and how good it is and make them proud. They say things like they're trying to steal our language. They're trying. You put those words, they're trying to steal, they're trying to ruin, they're trying... Somebody from who, who lives in some town who doesn't know what's going on in Montreal, doesn't understand that people are speaking both languages, you scare that person. Yeah. That person thinks, holy fuck, they come destroy my culture. Fuck these people, right? But they're doing it on purpose. They're doing it on purpose to scare so that they just listen. They listen. Because yeah. in reality, I haven't met somebody who came here and said, uh, my job is to destroy the culture in Quebec. Most people, even Anglophones that I speak, the ones that are trying to learn French, like the fact that it's different. They don't want it to become Ontario. They don't want it to become just... I myself, I don't want it to look the way Houston looks. The way I don't... I like what it is here. I like the fact that it's bilingual. I'm proud of the fact that I could go to a different place in the world, tell them that my city speaks two languages better than a lot of you speak one. You know, I like that. Mm -hmm. But new people coming in, the second they get targeted, well, your they, defense mechanism afraid, kicks in. I think they're afraid that if it's two languages, officially, that the dominant language... Is going to be English? slowly drown the other one. I'm all for having both. I, I don't like the that's, idea that's of... The, that's the dream, but I'm I feel like it. Th we're not in a perfect world. Yeah. And I feel like that's a legitimate fear to lose that language completely from a very dominant language that has allies all around it. You mean like because uh, English is so oh, universally spoken? Ontario and then the yeah. Maritime is for the most part, and then the states are right under, and they're all English, and they're all coming in. And if it becomes bilingual, it's slowly becoming... I don't... I want bilingualism. I'm all for it. I make a living off being bilingual. I, uh, I'm very proud to know both. But I, I understand their fear. Because I, I don't... Because I don't think there's French people that are going to grow up in Quebec and won't learn French. You're not going to find... Uh, Quebec families that are going to be like, you know what, we're not learning Quebec French. Quebec or Montreal. Uh, because it's two completely different things. From having traveled yeah. to do comedy outside and so just having a few references so in English let's, let's outside of uh, Montreal. So let's take Montreal off the off the table yeah. and let's say Quebec apart from Montreal. There's no families in Quebec, I think, that are going to be like, you know what, you're going to grow up only English, no French. It's not going to happen. They're go Quebec by default is going to have maybe French yeah, no. in the ha maybe yeah, no. but Quebec by default yeah. high percentage is going to have French by default in well, the household. If you take out Montreal, it's like ninety eight percent. But that's what I'm saying. So they're going to have French is there for sure. It's yeah, going to be there for sure. Montreal governs. I, I mean, Quebec is the capital, but Montreal governs no, no, how no, Quebec is. How Quebec? All I'm saying is there's no French even in Mo there's no French households in Montreal that are going to grow be like you're not going to speak French. They're going to learn French. And in Montreal, they're also going to learn English. What I'm saying is they're going to learn French regardless. Like, I went to French school. Yeah. French was the, the mother tongue. Then came English. Yeah. Then came Greek. But it was French, this much, mm -hmm. barely even half of that English. I just, because of the way I speak, I got more involved in English. Um, and then uh, when I was in elementary, there was also Greek. Now, I had no choice, and I learned French, and I'm going to keep it, right? And the choice was the English. In Quebec, what I'm trying to say is since they're going to learn French anyway, these people are going to have to come out of Montreal at some point, whether it's vacation or not. Yeah. How is it going to hurt them to learn that, la of all languages, oh. at least English? Of that's course. that's all I'm saying. Of course. I'm not saying to forget French. And, and uh, like I said, I fully agree with it. I just don't know how. How to. I, I, I just mean I understand the fear. I. Uh, I just understand the fear. That's you, all. Yeah, you're I right. I understand the fear, and I, I think it's it's mismanaged how they handle the fear. I don't know I how to handle it either. Fear. I don't. You're you're right about. I like. But I'm thinking we've pinpointed about it. what the fear is. But I don't know. You're right. I don't know how to handle I don't it either. Think anybody does. Yeah. Because I'm all for learning more languages, and I'm all for Quebec being more inclusive in the sense that I want people who come here to be proud of Quebec yeah. and be proud of the fact that there's two languages and want to share it. I don't know how to get to that level, especially now because there's such a schism. Now it feels like apart from uh, like the artistic community, people who are more inclusive, apart from that community, everybody else is kind of really in the middle. It's either you're on one 
or uh, or on the other side. You know, like you don't have anybody who's going to be like, well, there's some good points here, some good points there. It's either no, you're with me or against me. When in reality, it's not like that. It's there are two languages being spoken. Yeah. Um, there is one fighting for survival, whether it's real or not. They are fighting for survival. They all think that they're doing it because they have to preserve the language, right? Yeah. So the happy medium in between, I, in my eyes, would be to not attack one or the other because all you're doing is growing resentment on both sides and then they enclose themselves. Because I don't want French people growing up uh, in Quebec not learning English for them. I don't want them doing yeah. that because then I know that when they go out, they're going to have trouble. They'll be like, holy fuck, I just came to New York and I'm an alien. Yeah. I don't understand what's going on. And likewise, I don't want... I, I actually find it offensive when uh, Montrealers who are born here don't speak French at all. Yeah. I find it weird because like, fuck, man, you had the opportunity. You're there. You're around it and you missed on that. And then you, you go out of, off the island in your own province and you can't communicate with people. Mm. Same way I see the reverse with Quebecers that leave Quebec. I view the same thing in Montreal when Montrealers leave the island and go to another part and they can't speak French. They can't speak the official language of the province. So that's what I'm saying. They're... There's no harm in learning them both, but right now it seems like one side is determined in, no, no, fuck it, I don't want to do that. And the other side is like, oh, well, fuck but you then. That's how our minds work, though. You were saying exactly that exact same thing about Spanish. And yeah. I'd love to be fluent in Spanish, but since I don't have to, I don't have to speak it, that I can survive without speaking it, I am not... Gonna force yourself to learn it. I'm not for it. I feel like I learn things when I have to. I have to. This is an interesting point. So do you feel like if people feel, at least in Montreal, for their survival, mm. um, they don't need French, they won't make the effort to learn it? No, well, that's why they're creating this fear. And that's why they're creating these obligations to learn it because they want to force people to feel obli- not obligated, but that they have to, to survive. Like for me, I didn't have the choice. When I was growing up, it was mandatory. You had to speak French, right? And French was the the main tongue in school, yeah. right? It was I didn't have the choice. However, that wasn't the problem. The problem with me in school was that when you would speak English in school, or I, I got suspended once for speaking English across the street at the bus stop when I was going home. That kind wow. of sh- yeah, I got suspended, and then my mom had to come to school. Um, and I was at the bus stop across the street, right? Um, going back home, it was like fucking three forty. And I got suspended because he came across. He saw me talking English. The principal, Monsieur Cousineau, uh, and uh, I got. And then my mom came, and it was the weirdest thing because she didn't believe me. She thought I got suspended for something else. There's no way you got suspended for speaking anything, you know? Yeah. Uh, and that's what happened. And these kind of instances, I know, can easily make somebody grow resentful, right? Yeah. And these are the situations that I'm talking about that hurt the language or hurt, uh, I guess, the cause of trying to preserve it more than anything. It's when you're not, when people feel like they're being oppressed on anything, your default strategy is, fuck it, I'm defensive, I'm cutting off, I'm doing my own thing. And then you close yourself off that. Where in Quebec, we have the opportunity to have both these languages, but, and I'm sure, uh, well, you know, I haven't seen it, but I know that if there's another town and it's more anglicized, that might even happen to some English kids where they get, uh, somebody gets pissed off at them for speaking French. And in return, then them too, they're like, you know what, fuck that, I, I don't want to speak English. I want, you know, because they, they put up their walls after. Nobody likes being picked on for yeah. something like that. So these are the things that I find hurt uh, the cause. Because I'm all for it. I don't want the culture to die. Um, I don't want it to become another generic North American city. Um, I'm proud of this place and I'm happy that it's like this. But I feel like the way we're going about it is completely wrong because you're just making people put up their walls. So the more, ru- the more we're digging our own grave, Right, because then it's going to become an enclosed society where everybody outside of Quebec is going to be uh, outside of Montreal, rather is going to be speaking um, French yeah. only. Yeah. And then in Montreal, it might turn into like almost exclusively English, which is not a good thing either. Because then you're the whole part of Montreal that makes it good is that um, multilingual. Because uh, it's not just bilingual. You can go places, you hear people speaking Italian and then French, and then throw in some fucking yeah. English, some Greek. You, I love that shit. But that's going to die if we continue chopping at people for. Um, you know, having a discussion of their language. That's yeah. what I mean. But That's what I think hurts it. It's still divided by Saint Laurent. It, it, historically, it was extremely divided. Like, French people wouldn't go west and English people wouldn't go east and it was completely... The island was completely divided between How the fucking two. crazy is that? <laughs> it's like uh, those old um, And all the immigrants... Movies. All the immigrants were living on Saint Laurent. That's why it's still like... They picked up. Picked, <laughs> but it, they were in the middle. Yeah. They were like a, a Jewish... Community is right, like where sh- around Schwartz is. The the Chinese are in Chinatown, like Asian, not just Chinese, but 
Italians are a bit uh, further up, uh, yeah. where Jean Talon is. And, like, all all this street is colonized by immigrants that came in and uh, that weren't French or English. The it's Greeks kept moving north. They started in downtown. Yeah. Then they were uh, towards, like, where Uchimon is now. Yeah. Where it's a big uh, Hasidic Jewish neighborhood. Then they moved Park X. Uh, then Saint Laurent. And now off the island, Laval. Yeah. They're like, fuck it, just north. Yeah. It's weird for people who love gonna end up southern. In yeah, they love like mm-hmm. southern um, temperatures. Yeah. They're just going up. Yeah. They're just going up. It's fucking ridiculous. But yeah, that whole div- it's true that line on Saint Laurent. It is we're not too far removed, at least by the years, um, of when it was really visibly divided. Yeah. So it is gonna take some time. I just really feel like we're going about it, and I say we because I'm part of this. You know, I'm part of Quebec. I'm part of yeah. uh, hopefully uh, the future. Uh, I don't think we're going about it the right way. I, either side, I feel like it's the same thing. I, I have also seen, um, like I said, all the cases that I'm talking about of uh, French people being shitty to English people, pff, I see it the same, if not more, on the other side. That's, that doesn't help. You know what I mean? Yeah. It doesn't, it doesn't, there's, it's not going to bring us to a proper place. Because like I said, people get defensive. People get defensive, they put their walls up. And the second they're up too high, you're not, win- you're not going over that. It's done. They've decided, they've made their stand. Right, yeah. and that's it. That's all you're getting from them, which sucks. Because like I said, we've got some here very unique, and if we continue like this, we're gonna ruin it. We're gonna be fifty, a hundred years from now, and it's gonna be another fucking, another regular North American city. You know, no character, no I pizzazz. I have a hard time seeing that happening. You yeah. would hope. Yeah. But look at all these other fucking cities. I'm sure they used to have personality. You you don't find that they do? Not a lot of them. There's some. There's some that do. There's so, like New York has a lot of little segments yeah. that has its own unique personality. Boston has a couple of those places too, and then you see the metropolitan areas. There even, even New Jersey is changing, right? Like yeah. Newark is cha- like I- I- without noticing, right? If you let them just assimilate and make everything is standardized, this is what it is. This is what like in Montreal, the walking culture is something big that we take um, for granted. We don't realize that it's not like that in every city in North America, where you could get out of the metro. Walk wherever the hell you want. There's stores that are connected. You go to a restaurant here. You go to a bar here. You go, you go to Laval. Yeah. You get in your you car. Need, yeah, you need. And go car. everywhere. That's a huge cultural difference. There's a big um, Montreal culture and Laval culture that are even different that people don't think about because a lot of people think about it as the same city where yeah. it really isn't because even the lifestyle is different. The way the houses are. These little differences. I like the way Montreal is. I, I like that personality that it has. Yeah. You know, and that's more when I go to Laval. It feels like when I'm in Houston. Or when I'm in other parts of, of the U- United States, this spread outness, the strip malls, you you know, you drive from this place to this place. Yeah. You know, that everything's distant. They're bigger, there's a lot of bigger stores, but that distance. Whereas Montreal has that closed, it's yeah. all a neighborhood, it's a giant neighborhood feeling. I think that's the uh, aspect of an island because New York is a walking culture as well. It's an island as well. New York has a lot of that, yeah. And it's an island, you know, like cities that are built. Well, Laval is an island too. Yeah, you're right. It's a you're garbage yeah, island. I totally shut my mouth there. On <laughs> <laughs> no, Long Island is an island too. They don't have that culture. Yeah, but L- Long Island is the Laval of New York. Garbage. <laughs> I don't know. I've never been. <laughs> I don't like it. Uh, not Long Island, Laval. Uh, just uh, the <laughs> way it's I've spread been to out. Laval. Uh, just the way it's spread out. Not, but it does have nice stuff. Like I've, uh, you know, there's something to appreciate about being able to have all these big stores and drive to it. But I like the little the nuances of going into a small shop and walking next to another one, not just this, you know, uh, programmed, this is the building, that's what's happening. This faceless kind of no um, no spice, no personality. Yeah. I like the small stuff, we're just walking around. Yeah, Montreal, I, I feel like I, your brother's like is still home to me, but Montreal is, you, we're talking about it, and we're talking about the negative aspects of Montreal, but... It's so. It's such a great city. It's such. That's the thing. It has. Imagine even with all the negative aspects. Yeah. We could shit on it all day. Yeah. You can't help but love it. Like it has something. Yeah. Now, do I wish we were governed by better people, who cared more? Yeah. But it doesn't change the fact that I still love the place. I still love the island. Uh, even though, right? What was that report that came out on the Champlain? There's already two thousand defects. Two thousand defects. Yeah. I don't know who was the engineer. Like, did did they ask? Like, yeah. But it's obviously like, it, if it takes longer and there are mistakes, there's more money coming in. There's more money coming in. Uh, that's one of the sad parts. Like, it's we're we're Gotham City. Yeah. You know that. 
This is this is the real Gotham City. Yeah. It's not New York. It's Montreal. Because <laughs> in New in New York, at least, if they used to say oh, it's run by organized crime. Montreal is run by the most unorganized crime syndicate, <laughs> the government here ever. Like I've never seen such disorganization and inability to just work as a team. Same thing when they're um, uh, drilling holes in the street. One company needs to drill a hole for you know the water for the electricity, but they won't talk to each other and do it at the same time. The same fucking city block will be dug up and closed off three times in like the last five years because oh I need to put in new wires. A year later, oh, we need to put in new pipes. You can't talk, and you all have to do this anyway. Do it at the same time. You spend less money. You all pitch in to fucking open uh, up the road. No, they don't. It's just every. It's just a fucking free for all. They do whatever the hell they want. Yeah, a few years ago in the old Montreal, you know how it's cobblestone in Montreal. Yeah. Uh, there was a hole, and they went in with cement, and then the guy who had to put the cement on the cobblestone called his boss, and he's like, "I have." To to tell you it's cobblestone here i can't put some and he got yelled at and like no that's that's what you have to do so this guy had to put this cement <laughs> on the call and people walking by like what, <laughs> what uh, and he's just like this guy he looks like a moron yeah he looks like a moron <laughs> but like he's just he had and he called and he's like are you disrespecting me and like no i, I can't put cement on shut up and do it and like follow the procedure yeah. mark yeah this whole procedure. This guy, I, I would have quit. I no, I probably wouldn't have because if I was in that situation, I I have a like syndicate job. Yeah, fuck and that. You, you just like fuck it. I'll pour the. Cement. But I would I would be saying it the whole time I'm doing it. Like, I'm. They're making me do this. <laughs> they're. I I I, I I I know this is stupid. <laughs> Without destroying. First of all, you're also destroying how it looks. Like yeah, fucking trashing well, it's old Montreal. It's fully dumb. Fully, fully it's dumb. remarkable. It's yeah. remarkable how we how we run this place. You know why? Because the people who really give a shit don't want to get into politics. I know that I, I do care, but I do not want to be involved in politics. No, it's too much for me. There's this scumbaggery, and then you're gonna you're gonna hurt your head dealing yeah. with these people. I yeah, no, it's it's not for me either. I'm gonna watch out for me. Create some fucking videos. Yeah, I'm gonna do me. I'm gonna do complain me. about it. I'm gonna be me. Then again. Do I have a right to complain about it if I don't feel like I should put in the work to do anything about it? Yeah, but don't you feel like you have more of a voice, a more liberal voice, if you're doing this? Yeah, that's the thing that I like about not being associated yeah. is that I could say whatever I want, yeah. you know? And anybody who comes on here says whatever they want to, they don't have to worry, like, oh, are you going to lose a sponsor? What sponsor? <laughs> you know? Except for Audible. Audible's a good sponsor, but they don't care. They don't care what we talk about. Way to go, Audible. Yeah, let's get you know what you know who should start sponsoring though fucking Tim Hortons because I always have Tim Hortons Cubs they have one more chance next podcast if they haven't reached out to me to sponsor I'm fucking taping Tim Hortons I like do you know how Tim Horton died no Tim Horton I hope ho- it was coffee related the hockey player he died uh, in a car crash oh that's and not good and they're saying he was uh, intoxicated the- and now Tim Hortons the shame is a uh, full time drive through so they probably give a lot of coffee to people who are trying to sober up on the way back oh, that's, that's it. so you think they've it's, saved some lives yeah I think Tim Hortons is doing is I don't know I just find it ironic all they need to do next he, that's how he died I mean it's good saving lives from drunk drivers but if they uh, could they're just not saving lives well, if they could consistently get... If people get think they're getting sober from drinking one coffee... It, you know what you need? It's the opposite, actually. It's water. You need to yeah. get hydrated. This is dehydrating you. Yeah. But you know. they're not... That's not their objective, I think. No, obviously. <laughs> yeah, they're not there in that business. Yeah. But if they can just work at getting my orders right, even yeah. better. But they fuck up simple orders. They've been doing it for... It's not just me. I like to play the victim here, but it's not just me. <laughs> They'll fuck up simple. It, I think it's just you. Could you imagine? <laughs> it's like, oh, it's that fucking asshole oh, again. No, people are calling in. Now. No, I've never had that yeah. problem. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's like, I just ordered a large coffee. The guy's like, sir, we don't serve cheeseburgers. It's like, who fucking asked for a cheeseburger? <laughs> we don't understand. <laughs> we don't understand. We don't want to speak to you. Well, yeah, JC, thank you for fucking coming on. Thank you, Benzelis. And um, talking about Russians, coffee, and Quebec. Yeah. I think we covered everything. We comedy, covered coffee, sports, Russians. comedy. Yeah. Montreal. I don't think we solved the Quebec crisis, though. It's above pu- us. I think we put it out there. I think we, what we did with the Quebec crisis is we really illustrated the problem, illustrated the situation, not necessarily the problem, but we illustrated what it was. We don't have the solution. We don't pretend to have them. No. So 
we said what we had to say on the issue. Jesse Surrett, Pantelis. spoken like a true man. Um, I got all your stuff appearing now for the people so they could follow you on the Twitters, on uh, the Facebook website. Whatever you have, we're putting up, and they're going to follow. Perfect. Thank, Thank you, you very coming much. On.